Good morning. Professor Virtu Anderson, the president of the Nanyang Technological University, Professor Bank Norden, chairman of Molecular Frontier Foundation, distinguished speakers and VIPs, ladies and gentlemen, teachers and students, welcome to the 2012 Molecular Frontier Symposium at Nanyang Technological University. My name is Yuhyun Park. I am the Asia Director in the President's Office at NTU. I also have the privilege to serve as the lead organizer for this event. It is truly wonderful to see you all here. In addition to the members of our NTU communities, we have over 400 students from Singapore's JC, JC schools joining us today. This weekend's symposium is truly unique and special. Together with Molecular Frontier Foundation and the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, we have organized this event to help society, especially youth, understand what science is really all about. Not from the textbook, but from the real life experiences of the world's leading scientists. Many scientists say curiosity is the key in ingredient for scientific discovery. It is not about the right answers, but rather the right questions that lead you to real innovation and new breakthrough. So we encourage you, encourage you all, not just sit in your seats and listen to the talk, we want you to engage and communicate with the speakers. Our event is truly global today. Right now, the symposium is being broadcast live throughout the world, and there are students from Korea, Malaysia, and Philippines, and many other places watching us through the online live broadcasting. We'll get comments and questions from Facebook and Twitter, and in Korea, 10 high school representative students are joining us from the local Cisco office via two-way interactive feed. Why don't we say hello to them? Hi. <laughs> Hi, Korea. Are you ready for the symposium? Can you speak up? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> OK. The focus of this symposium is on emerging technologies in biomedicine, and there has never been a more opportune time in this field. Many of the world's greatest scientists at the forefront of these advances, we are science superheroes, changing our world, are here among us today to share their thoughts and ideas. We look forward to an exciting round of events and hope that you will enjoy yourselves this weekend. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage a leading international scientist, Professor Bertil Anderson, formerly the chief executive of the European Science Foundation and a member of the Nobel Foundation Board. Professor Anderson currently serves as president of Nanyang Technological University. Please welcome Professor Bertil Anderson. Thank you, distinguished guests, colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen, teachers, and of course, all students, students here and everywhere in uh, the world. <laughs> Great. So good morning and uh, welcome to Nanyang Technological University at its beautiful tropical garden campus. It's slightly high humidity this morning, but the will, sun will soon shine again. Uh, it's also my great pleasure to welcome you to the opening of the Molecular Frontier Symposium, set up in collaboration between NTU, the Molecular Frontiers Foundation, and the Royal Academy of, of Sciences. The focus of this symposium, as we heard, is emerging technologies in biomedicine, and that's indeed a very exciting area for research and an excellent an excellent example of a molecular frontiers topic. The Molecular Frontiers organization is very much, I would say, a brainchild of my Swedish colleague, Professor Bengt Nordén from Chalmers University in Gothenburg. Okay, so you realize I'm from Stockholm, so there is some rivalry there, but it's okay. 
He's also, of course, representing the Royal Academy of Sciences uh, located in Stockholm. Uh, he has also, as many of you know, been a dynamic chairman of the Nobel Committee for Chemistry for several years. And uh, more recently, he's been moved up the rank. He's also the chair of the NTU Research Council. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Professor Noden is a passionate about science. I know that from many long discussions not only in chemistry, but also other areas, not the least in life science and biomedicine. He is also convinced that we need to communicate the excitements of science and research to younger generations. Using his insights and global network of high-level colleagues, including, of course, Nobel laureates, he has been going from talking to doing and using the Swedish Academy of, of, of Sciences as a base. He started Molecular Frontiers, Molecular Frontiers Symposia, to discuss the hottest scientific frontline topics, gathering and mixing the best brains in the world, and at the same time, opening up the symposium to young students and, and uh, uh, present in the lecture hall or connected online from all corners in the world just as we are doing here today. I personally had the privilege to be engaged with Professor Nordin and the Molecular Frontiers through the years. So, needless to say, I am very excited, also a little bit proud, as a Swede and as the president of NTU, that Molecular Frontiers now has a hub here in, in Singapore and the Nanyang Technological University. So why, so why is Molecular Frontiers going to Asia? And why Singapore and why NTU? Well, you see, excellent ideas do not stop at na na national borders. The concept of Molecular Frontiers is too important and cannot be confined to Sweden and Stockholm, and I hope I will not lose my passport in saying this. Location Asia is also logical, considering where bulk of tomorrow's talents will come from. And in a way, the future is already here. The Royal Society, some uh, months ago, showed that China next year will take over from the United States in producing most scientific publications in the world. The number of citations will probably require another five to ten years, but I'm sure it will come. Singapore, of course, is not quite as big as China, but it is one of the countries in the world that invests most new money into research on a per capita, per capita basis, and uh, with top universities such as NTU, I should also be generous and say NUS, as well as ASTAR, of course. Singapore is Asia light, where East meets West. And I feel that's where Molecular Frontier should be, right there in between East and West. Our NTU is today one of the most rapidly developing universities on the international scene. We have in recent years attracted top researchers from the US and Europe. Our ambition is, of course, to attract the best young students. So it's indeed very rewarding to see so many Singaporean students here today, this morning. I'm sure all students will have exciting and inspiring days here listening to the best scientists in the world. The topic, Molecular Frontiers, as I said, is a good example of emerging frontiers. And also for NTU, it's also very relevant since we are the big engineering university. We'll start a medical school next year together with the Imperial College in London, another engineering university strong in medicine. So, let me conclude. I wish you an enjoyable and fruitful learning experience during this weekend. I hope that you will interact and learn from our distinguished speakers who have been invited here today to share with you their knowledge, expertise, and vision. Don't be shy, ask them questions. And to all the students in the crowd, I hope that you can see that each one of these distinguished speakers was once in your shoes, being curious on the scientific questions. 
Just like our distinguished speakers, you have every chance in the world to make a great achievement that will change our world. That's inspirational, and Molecular Frontiers is all about inspiration. Let's all get inspired this weekend. I wish you all the great success. Thank you very much. You don't have to sit down. It's your turn. <laughs> it's my honor to introduce our next speakers, uh, Dr. Bank Norden, a leading international scientist and pro professor of physical chemistry at Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden, the former chairman of the Nobel Prize Committee in Chemistry. Dr. Norden is the founder and chairman of the Molecular Frontier Foundation and will officiate our symposium. Hello, everybody. Hello, Korea. <laughs> Are you there? Good. <laughs> well, I think uh, the president, our host here, Bertil Andersson, has said most of what uh, has to be said here. I am very grateful to him for inviting us to have this Molecular Frontiers Symposium here. Um, he gave you a short history. Uh, I could fill in that uh, I think everything began in 2001 when we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Nobel Prize in Stockholm with a symposium where, which I was in charge of and where I, it was called uh, Frontiers of Molecules. And, or molecular sciences. And we dared to invite people from uh, a very wide spectrum, of, uh, ranging from physics to medicine. And my co-organizers were, in fact, skeptical. They thought that we would lose communication. People would not understand each other. But in fact, it turned out to be successful. Uh, and the um, communicating catalyst, the paradigm of communication, was the molecule. So the molecule is the red thread through uh, a lot of activities. And as you know, it's important to us, to our environment, and uh, also what we are made of. Uh, the air we breathe, the, the water we drink, the food we eat, and so on. So um, the uh, molecular frontiers uh, as you heard from Professor uh, Anderson, has a um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, as its goal to promote understanding and appreciation of molecular sciences. And um, there are two, um, and it's hosted by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in Stockholm. Um, and now we have also the, uh, the happy event that we have installed a hub in Singapore, which will be the center of a lot of scientific activity in uh, Asia, uh, from Australia up to um, China and India. Um, the, um, uh, the task, the aim of Molecular Frontiers um, uh, Foundation is um, uh, two th things, uh, or two things, it's to identify um, I think we lost communication now, both with Korea and... Uh, th this is the weak point of the, the, the modern IT society. that you, uh, It's so vulnerable still. Uh, it, you are in the hands of a few experts on sound and uh, vision and so on. Uh, so, first of all, to identify the breakthroughs in... Um, at the research frontiers. And this is the stuff that the Nobel Prizes are made of. Um, that is the discoveries, the, uh, um, the uh, changes in thinking, 
that leads to progress. That's one thing. The other is to make society, especially young people, interested in science. And um, <laughs> and uh, this is um, uh, in turn very important for various reasons. Uh, one is uh, getting the young people all of you who are here, um, to consider the possibility that you go into a scientific career. That is, that you educate yourself and, um, uh, for instance, start as at uh, Nanyang Technological University. So I see clearly that uh, Bertil Anderson had as a, a reason to, uh, uh, to endorse, to support our activity. Um, but there is also another reason why people should um, educate themselves in science, and that is to be able to follow the development, the ongoing development in uh, technology, health sciences that's going on around us. This is important for everybody in the science, in the society. It's a responsibility, and of course, among uh, the society, we also find the politicians. And something that uh, I today uh, get a little concerned about is a gap between the understanding of the politicians and the fast-moving scientific frontiers. So um, the education and the uh, um, outreach of science is really an important issue. We also uh, have to our disposition a, an excellent scientific advisory board. Uh, it consists of 30 eminent uh, scientists, including 12 Nobel laureates. Um, we have uh, Barry Sharpless here sitting in the audience, uh, who uh, from this morning, without knowing it, becomes one of the members of the scientific advisory board. Welcome, Barry. <laughs> So these are scientists who are not uh, only eminent and at the frontiers of science, they are also burning for um, going out with their messages and interacting uh, with young people. And uh, I'm sure there will be questions during the uh, meeting here. Uh, we have another eminent scientist sitting on the front row, also in the Scientific Advisory Board. That's uh, Professor Craig Venter. Uh, who will give the first talk in a few minutes. Um, and he, uh, if we take Barry and uh, Craig, they represent two orthogonal base vectors in uh, sp spanning up space. Different ways of thinking, but uh, indispensable for the um, progress of science and, uh, and technology in, in the society. Uh, we um, support a number of activities listed here. We have these uh, annual uh, fr molecular frontiers symposia. As a matter of fact, we have two occurring this spring. This one in Singapore and in Stockholm, we have one around uh, which has to do with, um, uh, with the, the uh, environmental problems of the world occurring by the end of May. Uh, we have forum live. That's young people, like the audience here, taking part in the symposia and asking questions. And uh, we have a um, <clears throat> website called Moleclues, not molecules, Moleclues, which is an interactive site um, uh, where you could ask questions and you could play games and so on. And then we have the Molecular Frontiers Inquiry Prize, awarding the best science questions from young people. And every year we award five girls and five boys for asking what has been judged to be the best questions. And you may ask, why do we award questions and not answers? And I think um, one answer is that uh, uh, to define a question, to ask a question, uh, you have to uh, apply a certain analytical talent. You have to 
um, uh, work more than you do when you look into the textbook to find uh, the right answers. And I also think that um, there is a uh, rebellious thinking that might uh, appeal to the young audience uh, in uh, asking why. Um, uh, in that sense, we send the message that you may not um, uh, trust too much your often boring and authoritative textbooks as long as you could come up with a good why. And I think that's, um, that's very encouraging and uh, that is ex indeed the, the way of uh, um, uh, scientific thinking that you, you should um, have. So, um, uh, and if you look into the uh, literature and uh, into science history, you find uh, very often that if you go back to the original texts, uh, you, you can understand how the scientists were thinking and, and very often what the questions were. So, for instance, I find myself uh, that Albert Einstein, whose um, uh, PhD thesis was not really in physics, it was in physical chemistry. He was interested in the molecules. He was interested in knowing uh, how to determine from the motion of molecules Avogadro's number, that is, uh, the number of molecules in a mole. You may think of him as the father uh, of uh, uh, the theory of relativity only, but he had many th thoughts uh, also in the uh, chemical direction. So, um, <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, still the, uh, it is the outreach endeavor of Molecular Frontiers that has given it its global character. And um, what I think is interesting there is that an impact of uh, not only these uh, symposia, but also the interactions across the borders, um, not depending on nations, could have um, many important consequences. And one being that young people, uh, independent of culture, communicating, that must be the basis of developing understanding, which in turn is, of course, important for stability and peace. And secondly, of course, uh, the hunger to, um, to uh, learn varies a lot across the borders. And I think I've noticed that in Asia or in the developing world, world the hunger is much greater than in many um, uh, Western countries. And that may lead to that the ability of asking questions increases in these countries. And uh, eventually that uh, you, you young scientists here, will take the lead in the future development of science. And I think that's just a, as right as it should be. But I also think that that is, from a strategic point of view, very interesting. It may be that uh, you will take the leadership of the development of science. So um, again, I, uh, I want to thank um, uh, Nanyang Technology University for hosting this meeting, and I also want to thank the people who have been uh, in charge here. Uh, Yu Yang, you, can, can you stand up? And uh, so... <laughs> we also have some Swedes coming in here. We have um, Magdalena Eriksson, who is stationed now as director for Ames University in Ghana. Where do we have Magdalena? Please stand up. <laughs> and at her side, Luis Fernando, who uh, you may recognize from the movie you saw. Please. <laughs> and um, Dr. Per Turen, also from Sweden. And Dr. Andreas Mershin from uh, uh, Russia or Greece or uh, MIT. <laughs> and Andreas uh, has been in charge of the Best Inquiry Prize. 
And as a matter of fact, this prize for the best question was the first time uh, a question was awarded. Now, following other exam uh, our example, several other um, activities around the world have taken up this possibility to uh, uh, home into uh, the best questions. So you may ask uh, why top scientists and many others contribute so enthusiastically on a voluntary basis to molecular frontiers? Because um, we may ask this question because there is very little money as it is today in molecular frontiers, unfortunately. People uh, use their own savings to, uh, to travel here and uh, uh, to contrib contribute. And um, I think one reason is that um, Many scientists and other people today feel deep concerns about our future. Uh, science has played and will continue to play an indispensable role in how we deal with natural resources, environment, diversity of life on Earth, and human health. Problems that lie close to our hearts and engage us directly. Many examples from the history of science show that we are usually hopelessly inept at predicting future consequences of serendipitous fundamental findings, the general importance of practical applications and occasional harmful effects are often initially obscure. So to further develop our society and to understand the importance of advances in science, we need not only a new generation of talented sciences, but we also need, as I mentioned, <clears throat> that those who are not scientists uh, partake in the ongoing global scientific discussion. Politicians, as I said, sometimes appear disconnected from science and one could envisage the fatal consequences if the knowledge gap in scientific understanding between the leading scientists and the public and politicians becomes so large that communication is lost. So what are then the goals of molecular frontiers and what will happen in the future? Well, you have heard um, most of it already. Uh, and. Um, uh, as I said, the, uh, the uh, crossing nations aspects of interactions is very important. But finally, it could not be enough emphasized that science is useful. The economic success of Singapore and other East Asian tigers a couple of decades ago and of China and even India today is partly based on the fact that these countries offered good opportunities for university studies in engineering and science and convinced many young people to use these opportunities. In China, about half of all university students today study science and technology, compared to 15% in slow growth Denmark, from where our president just arrives this morning. <clears throat> and 12% in Africa. And this 12% is an average. There are regions in Africa where the figure is as high as 50%. I'm convinced that economic development of nations to a large extent depends on their ability to motivate young people for careers in science and technology. The quality of secondary school science and mathematics being a key issue in this context. And here molecular frontiers may also have an important role by connecting with the science teachers. Finally, the requirement of speakers at the Molecular Frontier Symposia to address a broad audience has, I believe, also greatly stimulated to make the lectures understandable to non-expert academicians too, and to move forward how we think about the problems, what we know and what we do know, not know, and not least, what we do not understand at all. The latter, what we do not understand, seems to be universal in the ability to turn on young minds. And with that, I thank you all for your attention.